Often I hear the phrase, God loves you, proclaimed to a group of people, which may include both Christians and non-Christians. Is this biblical to say that phrase to just anyone? Well, when we look at the concept of the love of God in Scripture, we see distinctions that have to be made. Historically and theologically, we distinguish among three types of divine love. There is the love of benevolence, where God has a, a kind spirit to the whole world, and His benevolent will, and His benevolent love falls on everybody. But there's also the sense in which uh, the Bible, the love of God is defined in terms of God's beneficence. That is, that's not just simply what His attitude is towards the world, but how his, He displays that goodness universally. The rain falls upon the just as well as on the unjust. And so that universal dimension of the love of God is manifest. But usually when we're talking about the love of God in popular language, what really is what we're talking about is what we call God's love of complacency. And that term, the love of complacency, is not used in the way in which we use the term complacency in our age, in our culture, in our complacency, our term of complacency means uh, smugness, self-satisfaction, that sort of thing. But rather when the Scriptures uh, indicate the love of complacency, it's that special love that God has for His Son and all of those who are in His Son and who are adopted into His family. And if we talk about the love of God in His terms of the love of complacency and talk about it universally, that's blasphemy, because God does not love the whole world in the love of complacency. The fact the Scriptures tell us that there are many ways in which God is at enmity with the world. He hates the world. He hates those who are swift to shed blood, and, uh, and we have to take that into account. When I hear preachers stand up and say that God loves everybody unconditionally, I want to scream and say, wait a minute, then why does He call us to repent? Why does He call us to come to the cross? Why does He call us to come to Christ? If God loves everybody unconditionally, then you can do whatever you want and believe whatever you think. And that's just not true that God loves us unconditionally. He's placed an absolute condition by which He requires. He doesn't just invite people to come to His Son. He commands all men everywhere to repent of their sins and to come to Christ. And if you want to enjoy the love of complacency, you have to be in Christ. When everyone is talking about the love of God and God loves me just as I am, how would you respond? The kingdom of God is not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I think there are few things more dangerous than preachers out there preaching that God loves everybody unconditionally, because the message that is heard by the people who hear that is, there are no conditions. I can continue to live just as I'm living in full rebellion against God, and I have nothing to worry about because there aren't any conditions that I have to meet. God loves me unconditionally. I don't have to repent. I don't have to come to Jesus. I don't have to leave my life of sin. Uh, no conditions, no strings attached. God loves me just the way I am. He's glad that I turned out so nicely, and <laughs> so on. But there is a sense. I've written a book on the love of God, where I talk about the three ways in which theologians speak about the love of God. God's love of benevolence, where God has a good will towards everybody, believers and non-believers. Beneficent love of God. God gives benefits 
to people, whether they're believers or not believers. The rain falls on the just as well as on the unjust. But the most important consideration is the love of complacency, not the love of smugness, but what is meant by the love of complacency is the filial love that God has for the redeemed. And that love is directed first to Christ and then to all who are in Christ, our elder brother. And that salvific love is not something that God has for everybody unconditionally. And sometimes we ter close our eyes to what the Bible says frequently about God's posture towards the impenitent. God, the Bible tells us, abhors the wicked. That's strong language. God abhors, detests the wicked who are impenitent. And then people say, well, God loves the sinner. He just hates the sin. But he doesn't send the sin to hell. He sends the sinner there. And so this is very dangerous stuff when we tell people God loves you unconditionally. You know, so we have to do it from a biblical perspective rather than trying to change the biblical character of God. God is angry every day against the wicked, and justly so. And his every impenitent sinner is exposed every second to the rage, the fury of God's wrath, as Paul tells us in Romans 1, 18 and following. And, <clears throat> but again, like you said earlier, there's no understanding of the good news apart from the bad news. Christ came into the world that was already under the universal indictment for rejecting God the Father, for living in a, uh, a sense where the clear revelation of God, as you've pointed out, Steve, was so made manifest to every human being. But our nature is so fallen that we don't want God in our thinking. We don't want God in our minds. And we want so much to win people to Christ that we'll do everything we can to hide from them the reality of the wrath of God. We don't tell them that every moment that they refuse to repent, that they are heaping up wrath, Steve, <laughs> against the day of wrath. Um, and, and, but people aren't afraid of the wrath of God. And it's because we're out there telling them, you don't have to be afraid of God because God is so nice and he, and it's Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. It takes the terror out of it. Uh, knowing the terror of the Lord, Paul says, we persuade men. Uh, it's a fearful thing, a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Um, the, that, that is, preaching that God loves you unconditionally is the wrong message. The sinner needs to be terrified about his condition. He doesn't need to feel comfortable in the fact that he's turned out so well, as R.C. put it. You know, just in the last year, John, I've had two guys come in the membership in our church as adults, baptized as adults, by the way, <laughs> who in their testimony, their testimony is that what drove them to the gospel was they realized that they were on their way to hell. Yeah. And that uh, scared them, literally scared them the hell out of them, <laughs> right? And rightly so. Yeah. Now, that's part of what Steve was saying. Excuse me, Chris. That's, that's part of what Steve was saying. If we're going to ever call a nation to righteousness, the, the preaching has to dramatically change. It has to dramatically change. <laughs>